Well, man, it is awesome to see you guys here this morning. Um, I, I, I just love this day. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, you can turn to Matthew 25. We'll jump around a little bit, um, but the, and the, the passages will be up on the screen for you. Um, but today is Roundup Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a few people that have been around our church for a while that kind of cheer with an extra little bit of enthusiasm because this is really kind of our, just to give you a little history, it's kind of our, our Roundup reboot of sorts. Um, we have celebrated Roundup for years and years and years and years. But one of the things that we noticed was happening is when we would have Roundup, and maybe it was just the time it was picked or whatever, uh, the time when we were supposed to be rounding everybody up, it seemed like everybody was busy. And so it was getting harder and harder to do, and, and, and attendance wasn't happening, so we thought, okay, we need to try something fresh and new. And, and just by renaming it, man, everybody went crazy and was like, no, we can't mess with Roundup. And, and let me tell you, I, I love... I love me some good Roundup, okay? And, and some of you might be thinking like, what does that mean? No, really, actually, I really do love the whole idea of a Roundup. You see, every little boy at one point in their lives desires to be a cowboy, right? And maybe little girls, they want to be a cowgirl too. Trust me, I have four daughters, and we have a plethora of cowboy boots around our home. Okay, um, they, they just love it. And, and we listen to country music when we're on vacation and even when we're just driving around town some. So, but, but really, it, the, the, these country roots, this roundup idea it kind of goes deep into our, into our lives. It started out for me really early. Um, I, I've shown this picture before, but um, this, this was me um, early on. Um, what, what I love about this picture, there's multiple things. Um, the one that cracks me up the most is when I, I, I showed this to my daughters for the first time. They all looked at it and they said, Dad, you used to be cute. <laughs> I wasn't sure exactly like how, how to take that. I'm like, oh, okay, well. Um. But the funny part, my, dad, my mom and dad are here today and they can vouch for all my stories. I've, I've used some of these before. Um, it's nice to see all the hands. This is your first roundup with us because I can use some of the stories that I've used in years past. And they'll be new to you. But um, what was funny is the, uh, the, the guy would come around the neighborhood with this little pony and he would take pictures of people. Um, but he had to take the picture from only that side because, um, and, and my dad tells me the story, is because um, the guy only had one boot. And so he would stick the, the, the left boot on and then so you had to take the picture from that angle um, in order to, to get it. But in, in our family, I think I was five or six years old uh, at this time. But in all seriousness, our family uh, has some real cowboy roots in us. Uh, my parents live at a place now um, that we, in our family, we affectionately just call it the ranch. And you've heard me talk about it if you've been around church for a long time. Um, some of you have been able to, to go there with us. Um, it's a wonderful place because it contains a lot of history for us. Uh, if you were to just go out there and see it today, um, you wouldn't maybe think of ranch. You would think of, you know, um, house on the hill in the middle of nowhere is what you might think instead of ranch. Um, but there is, there's, there's like a slab of cement there that has the handprints of my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and there was how, uh, the house used to be there where my grandmother was actually born. And um, we call it the ranch because when I was young, um, I had an uncle who lived just across the highway, and he actually had a, a ranch. He had cattle, and um, and so, uh, in fact, I think we have a picture. Uh, this is this was it just not too long ago, cause, so it was old. Um, but uh, we spent a lot of time um, out at this place, and and every once in a while, uh, we would get the phone call, or we would just go out, and my uncle who had the cattle and they were roaming out in the hills. And, and he would say, okay, it's time to, time to round up the cattle. And we would have so much fun. We, we thought, we, well, I guess in, in a real sense, we were cowboys because we would actually ride out. Um, even when I was little, I remember even riding the horse with my dad. We got a little bigger and we'd ride ourselves out by ourselves. As, as we got older, even in technology change, we used to go round up on motorcycles. Uh, that, that made it a little more fun for us sometimes. And, and you know, you've seen the movie City Slickers, some of you. Um, uh, it, it was kind of interesting because people will pay a lot of money. Um, so maybe some of you have done that, to go to the dude ranch and actually like, you know, go on a real roundup. Uh, we got to do it for free and it was really, really a lot of fun. 
And, and um, after herding the cattle out of the hills, uh, we would bring them back, and there was this long fence. It was like a lot longer than that looks. Um, and uh, there's a spot right down the middle, and we would bring all the cattle in on the other side, and then we'd have to have them cross the highway. So we would, you know, set up the horses or the motorcycles out there and stop, have to stop traffic sometimes, and we would drive the cattle across the road. And we always thought that was really cool because it was like something you might see in a movie. And we'd drive the cattle across and down this big... Um, this big uh, kind of passageway, driveway area. And then there was two sides um, to, the, to the property. And so what would happen was, is we would, we would then separate uh, the cattle. Uh, some, you know, the, the ones that had my uncle's brand and everything, uh, we'd separate them over uh, to the one side. Uh, then there were some new ones, like all the little babies and the moms and stuff. We'd separate them to the other side and over on the one section with the, with the cattle that that didn't have any brands on them yet or something, every once in a while there would be a cow that, um, that was bigger and, and it was like my uncle didn't think it was his cow but it didn't have a brand on it and so we would call the dairy down the street because they had a big dairy, had dairies all over the place and every once in a while someone would get a little crazy out on the highway, you know, take out a little section of fence and the cattle, you know, and cattle are interesting. If cattle see another group of cattle, they just will automatically migrate there. They, you know, they're, they're, they group up a lot. And so, uh, you know, the cattle would kind of get out on the road and see the other cattle, and he'd try to get over there. And so the cattle would sometimes mingle over there, and so we'd have to take the cattle back and things like that. And, and after we would separate these cattle, um, we, we would have, you know, my uncle would do things like sometimes they'd have to get immunization types of things. And, and, then, um, and then what we always thought was interesting, and I know some of you might think it sounds cruel, but um, we, we always thought the branding was cool. In fact, I brought, we have a couple of brands here. Um, this was actually, this one actually is our family one. It just has an L on it, and this was another one. And you'd, you, you know, you'd kind of heat that up, and you'd stick it on there. And, um, and, and while for some of you, you might think, wow, that, you know, that sounds painful or cruel, it, it actually, it actually was super important. Because what would happen is that that symbol, that brand, denoted ownership. And, and, and those were the cattle that you took care of and that you fed and that you made sure that, you know, you did all these things for them. And so that was really, really important. This branding was a, a, a way of identifying, identifying that cattle's belonging. And that's something I think we, we really want to understand here is that, that this marking, this branding, it, it denotes belonging. And I think there's this spiritual connection, if you would. And I, do, I don't think it's too much of a stretch, but, but I think there is this connection to our spiritual lives and this whole idea that branding and ownership um, has this whole idea and it's vital to our eternity. You see, there will come a day, the Bible tells us, when there will be this huge roundup, if you would. Um, not a cattle roundup or anything, but a people roundup. And, and, and it talks about it in the Bible in the book of Matthew, chapter 25. And starting in verse 31, uh, Jesus says this. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, when Jesus returns again, he says, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him. He says, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats or as a cowboy maybe separates the different cattle and stuff like that. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom that has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. And so God's gonna, there's going to be this time where there's this gathering, and then when they are gathered, when they're kind of everybody's heard it in, there's going to be some separation that takes place in this situation. And, 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 so the, and then God turns to the people that are on his right, and this is what he says to them in verse 41. He says, um, or he said to them before, he says, you know, hey, come, those of you, who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared since the creation of the world. And he says, hey, the, and when I was thinking about that, I was, I was thinking about that passage, I thought, boy, this inheritance, this place that God has been preparing for us. And, and you know, the Bible tells us that, 
uh, God, it, was, it took him seven days to create everything that we see. And our world's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty beautiful. I was down, I got to take one of the vehicles down to the beach this morning, and just, it was so quiet and cool, and just the ocean, just to watch it, and God is, God is just amazing, and what he's created for us is so amazing, and beautiful, and spectacular, and, and demonstrates his goodness and his glory, and I thought, boy, that took him seven days, and he's been working on heaven for a few thousand years. Can you only imagine what that might look like? And he says, hey, come with me. And then it says, in verse 4 too, he says, hey, he says, then he says to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. To those who don't belong to him, he separate, they'll be separated from God forever. Now, there's been some debate in recent years about, you know, is there a real place called hell and things like that. The Bible certainly says that there is. And a place where people will be separated from God forever. So how do we make absolutely sure that we're the people who are, you know, on the, on the right side who, who, who get to be with him forever and not on the left side? I mean, how do we make sure that we hear welcome, okay, welcome in and not depart from me? How do we make sure that the brand of ownership that God wants to put on us is there and firmly established and we can enjoy eternity with him forever, and it's so important to, for us to realize that, that God has always wanted a relationship with us. He's always wanted to put his mark, his stamp on our lives. From the very beginning, when God created everything, I mean, when you go back and you look at Genesis, it says, with a word, he spoke everything into being. And then it came to man. And he did things a little bit differently. He didn't just say man and man popped up. He, he, it says he fashioned us and then he breathed his breath of life into us. But the cool part about that is, is, is that when God created man, he said, let us make man in our what? We were always created to be image bearers. People who would bear the image, bear the mark of God in our lives. That's what we were created for. But... The Bible tells us that every one of us has strayed. Every one of us has wandered off. We've gone our own way. We decided that the grass was greener over there and we took off and said, uh -uh, I'm going to go that way. When we would round up the cattle at my uncle's place, uh, we always knew that, that there would be a couple stragglers, ones that kind of just strayed off. Some of them some of them straight off just because we didn't, you know, it was like, hey, we didn't see them over there. Uh, a, a lot of them, they, they didn't know they were lost. They're stupid cattle, okay? There were a few that I am pretty sure they took off when they heard us coming, okay? And, and now think about that. That, that. And again, no analogy is perfect, but that kind of sounds like a lot of us. There's some of us Okay, who have strayed, and we're kind of like, we're, we're, we're just kind of living life, and we don't even necessarily think a lot about the fact that we've strayed. We're just kind of munching on the grass. We're just kind of doing life, and we haven't thought about it a whole lot. There's a couple of you with a rebel yell that say, I'm going the other direction, and you just take off. You, you just know that God wants you over here, and you're just going, no thanks, I, I'm going over there because this looks like a whole lot more fun to me, Right? And some of you just plain simple, just admit it, you do it just to be honoring. All right? But the reality is, is that it doesn't matter where you're at. God desires to seek every single one of us out. And he will go to great lengths to come and to find us and, and, and to seek us. And so we, we would go out and we would eventually find one or two that we would have to bring in. And um, and. and just like, I mean, all of us, like I said, have strayed. Um, and some of us who have strayed, it, it could be that, that we started out and we thought things were going okay. Um, but then, again, we saw the grass is greener over here. And we tried to put a different mark on our lives. We tried to cover up the, God, the mark that God wanted us to carry. And we said, no, I, I'm going to carry this mark. And remember, uh, the the, the ownership deal, okay, I mean, it, it's so important for us, again, to, to kind of work through that because marking equals belonging for us. 
And, and so many of us tried to replace God's ownership in our lives with, with a different kind of brand. Um, remember, my, one of my top 10 movies um, I love is the movie Toy, Toy Story. And, and years back, I did a whole sermon on, on the to, Toy Story thing because you, who, who was the cowboy? Remember his name? Yeah, see, you guys all know, all right? Good job. And Because um, it's such a great movie. And um, Woody had an owner. Who was his owner? Yeah. Now, how did you know? How, 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 did, how did everybody know that Woody belonged to Andy? Do you remember? If you lift up his boot, it says Andy on there, right? I remember when I preached a sermon years ago, I actually had some people who went home and wrote Jesus on the bottom of their foot with a Sharpie. Because naming, it, when you own something, you, you get to name, you name it. And, and, and you write, and, you, and, and that name on the bottom denotes ownership. But like I said, many of us have tried to cover up God's ownership in our lives and wear a different brand. Way back in the day, before there were fences and fancy stuff that cowboys use today, the cattle would just wander out there and people, you know, the cowboys go out, they would bring them in. And you would look at these cattle, and every once in a while you'd get one that was just all scarred up. Because what would happen is somebody would try to like find that cow somewhere else, and they would try to rebrand. They would try to brand over the brand. And when you try to brand over the brand, you know, you've already got some scarring, and now, now it's just a mess. And some of you... I think maybe all of us in some way, shapes, or form at different times in our lives, we experience the reality that when the world tries to brand over what God wants to stamp on our lives, that there can be a lot of pain and scarring that goes on with that. And sometimes we carry that around. You see, there's always this, the evil one that's out there trying to wrestle, rustle, I think is the real word, rustle the cattle away. Right? I mean, back in, the, back in the Wild West days, man, if you, if you were to do that and steal somebody else's cattle and things like that, you were in big trouble. I mean, that, that was cause for hanging and stuff like that, right? And, and, and how you identified whose cattle was whose was why, by the brand that they had on them. And, and like I said, sometimes it was the, the, the wrestlers, the wrestlers, wrestlers, I'll get that right, um, who would try to rebrand and scar up that cattle. Sometimes, sometimes we, we just try to replace the brand. We, we put different brands in our lives. Um, we, we, we get scarred by things. We, we get scarred by, by difficult relationships sometimes. We get scarred by different types of sin in our lives. Sexual immorality, things like pornography or promiscuousness, uh, alcoholism or addictions, abuse. And sometimes there are things that are done to us, like when the, the rustlers come and, and some of us struggle with pains that have been inflicted upon us and abuses that have happened to us and we bear the scars for those things. I mean, some of us, let's be quite honest, we, we've been branded. We've been branded by things like wealth or maybe even work. They put their mark on us. And really, if we take a good hard look at some of those things, the question becomes, what or who owns us? Who owns your time? Who owns your resources? Who owns your attention? Who owns your heart? Sometimes, as we try to hide those scars, we just try to slap something over the top I mean, like I said, we're meant to be image bearers. We're meant to carry images. And I think it's interesting. I think it was something I read by uh, Pastor Louis Giglio who, who talked about this idea that we're created to be image bearers and, and that we still today, um, marketers know this about us and so they get us to carry lots of images around for them. I mean, when you stop and you think about it, I mean, there's some that you automatically know and images that we just wear around, like, like here's this one. What, what's that one? Okay, and, and how about this one? Anybody know that one? Yeah, under, yeah some of you are covering up. It, don't worry, this is not a bad thing. You're not going to go on the left because of that, okay? Just, 
Just, just making sure. Um, how about this one? Anybody know this one? Ah, oh, yeah, Adidas or Adidas. <laughs> As, you know. Yeah, depends on how cool you are. Um, okay, now, th- how about this one? All the women. <laughs> I'm surprised y'all know. No, I'm just, um, and, then, and then what about this one? Yeah, we carry these images around with us, right? I do. I carry that, I carry that thing around with me all the time. And the list goes on. And again, while there might be nothing inherently evil about some of those things, and some of you might say, like, whoa, Pastor, is this really bad that I, you know, wear an Under Armour thing or, or, you know, have Nike shoes? No, no, it's, but the reality is, is that the question becomes, have those images, have you sold out to them? You see, sometimes because one of the things that we're all longing for is acceptance. One of those things is we're always longing for belonging. We want to belong. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, um, I've told this story before many times that um, I, I wanted to wear, like, I wanted, like, these 501 Levi jeans, right? Because that, that's what you're, everybody who was cool was wearing. Um, and my mom, though, uh, because she was really frugal and stuff, we'd go to Sears, which I guess is going out of business now, and we would buy tough skins. Okay? How many of you ever wore tough skins? That's why your knees hurt now. Just saying. Because you couldn't feel anything doing damage to them. And th- these jeans, for those of you who are too young and you didn't know, they had this pair of jeans that you would wear, and, and they had this, like, I don't know, man, what that patch was made out of on the top, but yeah, yeah, Kevlar or something, I don't know, and, you, and the, the whole deal was is if your kid put a hole in those jeans, um, you know, you could take them back and get new ones because these things were crazy, but they weren't cool, right? I mean, they, they were frugal, they were a good idea for parents, but for a kid, they were like, that, that, that wasn't cool, and you wanted to be cool. Why'd you want? Because you wanted to belong, right? And we have this longing in our life for belonging, and so because we long to belong, we allow ourselves to carry all kinds of images. We allow all kinds of things to mark our lives in the attempt to belong in places. And, and the thing that we need to really understand is this, is we will never fully experience the kind of belonging that God has created you to experience until you allow God's image to be what is firmly fixed upon your heart. If you're chasing after all the other images, you will continue to try and try and try to belong, but you'll always come up empty. It'll always fall short. It's not until we actually invite Jesus in and say, I'm going to take up your image and I'm going to bear your image on my life and on my heart that you will ever understand what true belonging is all about and we need to recognize there is a spiritual battle going on and the devil wants us to take on all these other images I mean think about it for a minute what other things in your lives are trying to own you there are all kinds of things in this world that are trying to own you that are things that are trying to stamp their image on your life but we need to allow God to write his name on our hearts. I, I love this passage in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. It says this. It says, and you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were what? You were marked. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And think about it. He, he places his mark upon our lives. And, and, and I love this whole idea that he, he puts us on our spirit. And then it goes on and says, he is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. I mean, that, that it tells us we are God's possession. See, we, we as red-blooded Americans, we, we, man, we, we push back against, it's like nobody's gonna own me. The funny thing is, I guarantee you this, if you don't allow God to have ownership of your life, there will be all kinds of other things in the world that will buy for ownership. 
and you will, you will let things in over and over and you will bear all kinds of different images until you realize that the only one that you can truly count on is God's image on your life. I love in this passage where it says, to the praise of his glory. Do you realize this? Your salvation isn't for your glory. We, we think that way because we think it's all about us. We think that, oh, salvation is all, all about, it's all for me. No, it's not. It's for his glory. Have you ever just stopped and realized and just glorify God and say, the reality that we even can have salvation, that none of us ever deserved any of that, and God still through his grace and through his abundant love for us said, I'm going to save you. That is to his glory. We're supposed to glorify him for that. Not say, okay, I, I, I'm good now. No, you'll probably still be bad. He's the one who is good. So how do we get the mark? It says, when we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Now again, I just want to remind us all, the gospel is the story of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That because we have all sinned, and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. The only way that we could be made right with God was for Jesus to come and give his life on our behalf and to offer salvation freely to anyone who believes in him. That is good news. That's what the word gospel means, is good news. Anyone who comes to him and says, Jesus, I want you to be Lord. I want you to take your rightful place as the owner of my life and the, uh, the one who is, sits on the throne of my heart. Lord, I realize I have strayed and I have tried to direct my life and I realize I need your help and I need you to be Lord. I've tried to find acceptance everywhere else and belonging everywhere else, but Lord, I need to find it in you. Another passage that talks about God's ownership is the 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22. It says, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of what? Yeah, ownership on us. And put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. God wants us to experience the joy of ownership. When you think of the joy of ownership as a, as, as a red-blooded American, what do you think of? The joy of ownership, right? It's like, that just means I own more. That's what most of us think, right? God wants you to experience the joy of ownership, which is this. If you allow him to own your heart, you'll experience joy. You don't have to work so hard to try to belong anymore. You don't have to work so hard to get all these things for you. You get to experience his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and all these good things that he will bring into your life when you trust him and allow him to save you. When, when we were kids, um, another fun thing we got to do when we were rounding up cattle is every once in a while we got to help take, them, take one or two to the auction. You have to be really careful when you go to the auction. We had to sit on our hands. Because if you waved at somebody at the wrong time, you'd buy a pig. <laughs> I was like, what are we going to do with that, right? <laughs> so everybody, my mom and dad were like, put your hands in your pockets. <laughs> Whenever my uncle would buy a new cow, he'd, he'd bring it home. And the first thing he'd do, he'd take it over, he'd do some of the things, and it would get the brand. It would get the mark. So that he knew that that was the one that he owned. And, and God wants to leave his stamping his mark, his Holy Spirit in our lives. And like I said, some of us push back on that because we don't want to feel like we're owned, but God wants to free you from the struggle of trying to belong, and he wants to just say, you belong with me. You belong with me. And the reality is, like I said, that you'll never come to a place where you fully feel acceptance or belonging. Or where those scars that we have accumulated on ourselves because of the things that we've tried to put over that mark in our lives, you'll never be free for them until you fully allow Christ to have his image firmly fixed on our lives. And so the question is, is will you allow him to do that? See, the great thing is, is he is searching you out. He knows all the other things that you've tried, but he's searching you out and he wants 
to place his image on your heart. And he continues to send his spirit and his love. And he continues to come and to seek you. And for those of us who have been found, our job, you know, find people are supposed to find people. And so we're supposed to go out and, in fact, the story, and I've told this story several times, but I love the story. So, and some of you are new, so you get to hear it for the first time. We were out um, gathering the cattle, and we got all the way in to the, to the shoot thing in the barn, and my uncle, I mean, it was like he knew them by name. In fact, all the cattle kind of had names if they'd been around for very long. And we get them all in, and we're, my uncle's separating them, and he turns around, and we were with my cousin. She was a real cowgirl. She, she knew how to handle all these things. And so my uncle turned around, and she, my uncle yells out and we're, to all of us, says, um, looks like Meanie has gone missing. There was actually a cow named Meanie. Okay? Um, the, and, and that cow earned its name. One day, actually, when, when my brother was riding a motorcycle, you can ask my dad about this whole story. It's, I mean, it's, my brother's riding his motorcycle, and that cow came out of nowhere and charged my brother and knocked him off his motorcycle because this cow was just mean. If you were sitting on the fence by the, by the corral and everything else, you had to watch out because that cow would come up and, like, charge the fence. It, it, this thing was just plain mean. And so my uncle says, hey, you guys got to go out and find Meanie because she's missing. We are like... Uh, no, let's just leave her. <laughs> Let the rest of the guys find that one. In fact, she ought to go to the butcher shop, you know? Just like, forget that. But my uncle, man, because he was the owner, he cared for her, and he says, no, you got to go find her. So we went out, and we're searching out and out and all over the place, and we couldn't find her anywhere. And, and finally, um, we, we got off our motorcycles that we were on at the time, and, we were, and somehow my cousin could hear this cow like mooing, right? And we were going around, we can't find this thing anywhere. Well, that winter there had been um, a lot of water and it had caused these big washout, these gullies. And they're kind of thin, you know? And the cow had somehow worked her way down in this wash and into a gully. And if you know anything about cows, um, they don't walk backward very well. Um, They can, but they don't do it very often. And so this cow had got herself kind of wedged into the spot where really all she had to do is back up, but, but she wouldn't. And so she's just like mooing, mooing, mooing like crazy. And so we finally see this thing. We get off the motorcycle. We start throwing rocks at this. Told you how I know we were mean kids, so <laughs> sorry. Just hoping that maybe, maybe we, you know, because we thought, hey, if the cow sees us, you know, might try to charge at us or something. So we're just throwing, you know, we're just like, hey, hey, you stupid cow, get out of there, right? And um, it, it wouldn't come, and we're looking at each other. Me and my brother are like, you go down there. No, you go down there. We're, you know, we're like, do we have a rope? Do we have anything? We have nothing. And finally, my cousin jumped off of her motorcycle went over to the side, and it was all kind of muddy. She slid down the side and right into the gully, and we are like, no, you're going to die. <laughs> you will die down there. That cow will, like, turn on you and tear you to shreds and everything. And so first, she's, like, trying to figure this out, and then she finally just, the cow's not doing anything, and she just walks up and smacks that cow right on the hind end. And it, the cow kind of starts shaking a little bit, and we're like, run for your life. And the cow starts moving and shifting and finally gets turned around and looks at my cousin. We're like, oh, you know, she's going to die, and we're going to see it, and that's not good. But then the cow just kind of stood there. We're thinking, what in the world's going on? And then my cousin just turned around and started walking, and the crazy cow just walked and followed her just followed her right out of that place. And so, and and literally followed her all the way home. And while no analogy is perfect, as I was thinking about that, I I thought, we were lost. We might have, we we were at a dead end. We We were all at a place where we were stuck. But because of the love of God, Jesus left his throne, 
came down to heaven into the muck and the mire and the mud of this world and said, hey, follow me home. Just all you got to do is follow me. And I don't know where you're at this morning or what images you are trying to put on your life, what type of things are trying to have ownership over you. But maybe today is the day that you need to say, you know what, I, I need to let go of all of those things that the world's trying to stamp on my heart, and I need to just get Jesus firmly planted on the throne right here. And if that's you today, then man, do we want to talk to you. There's no better day to do this. Um, we, have, we have people getting baptized at the beach. You can go down there and get baptized with them today if you need to do that. I mean, man, we got water right there. We could do it right now. But maybe you just need to say, I just need to place my trust and my faith in Jesus Christ. There might be a few of you in here this morning that have found yourself at a dead end. And you know, you, you, you just keep like pushing into this dead end. And you know what it is. And it's trying to mark and scar your life. Some of you are bearing the scars of, of just a constant life of trying to do it your own way. And for you this morning, all I can say is this, is maybe it's time for you to just give up doing it your own way and receive everything that God has for you. Because God doesn't want to just get you out of the mess. He wants to do great things in your life. He wants you to experience life to the fullest. He wants you to experience acceptance and belonging like nothing the world has to offer to you. Yet some of us keep banging our heads into the same old wall over and over and over again. We try to put all these other images and we're trying to fill our lives with all these other things and images and all this stuff. And, and, and I think that Jesus is just saying, hey, whoa, stop hurting yourself. Stop being hurt. Just turn and follow me home. Turn and follow me home. And maybe that's why you're here this morning. And so I'm going to ask our, um, our elders, um, uh, their uh, spouses, if they're with them, to, to come up front here as we sing this last song. And if, if there's something you need to let go of this morning and you would like some prayer for that, they'd love to pray for you. This morning, if you have been putting all kinds of other images on your heart and you know you need Jesus, man, we want to talk to you this morning. I'll be sitting right here, talk to one of our leaders. Because one thing is for certain, is that Roundup is coming. And the question will be, what image are you bearing? What mark is on your heart? What brand do you carry? Are you allowing him to be Lord of your life? And if he isn't already, make today the day. Because that would be better than anything else we could do. Just follow him home. Follow him home. He's come to free you today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, you're so good to us. That in our rebellion, in our lostness, in our attempt to cover up all the good that you want for us with things that we think we want for us, that Lord, you continue to come after us over and over and over again. And Father, you continue to shower us with your love. And so Father, my prayers for the one this morning that's here that just needs to make you Lord, that they'll have the courage to do that this morning. For the one that is at a dead end and simply needs to find their way out. Father, I, I pray that you will help them come and, and pray and talk with us this morning. That, Father, we would understand that in you we find every good thing. And you have nothing but great things in store for our lives. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.